Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have uh, Dr. Angela Cortelesa here talking about polymathy. Angela, take it away. All right, thank you, Srikant. Um, hi, everybody, good to see you all. A quick little uh, bit of information about who I am before we dive in. So as Srikant said, my name is uh, Dr. Angela Cotalesa. And in 2018, I earned my doctorate in human and organizational learning. And as part of that process, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the lived experiences of modern day polymaths. So that's who I am. What is a polymath you're asking? If you, if you are unfamiliar with the term, I'm gonna provide a definition before we dive in. And this is by Robert and Michelle Root Bernstein. And Bob, I consider as the, the leading expert in the world on polymathy and the forefather of polymathy studies. And he defines it as active engagement in multiple interests or endeavors, integrating vocations with avocations simultaneously or serially across the lifespan. That's his definition. I think it's a pretty good one. And I also want to point out, as I do on every time we have one of these meetups, is that to be a polymath does not mean you must be a Leonardo da Vinci. Like many human phenomenon, it exists on a spectrum. And so there's different degrees of how polymathic a person can be or not. There's, uh, you know, the, how, how much breadth the person has in any given field or endeavor, how much depth they have, and then also can they integrate across those, those fields. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the paradoxes of polymathy. And I think this is a really fun topic because so many of the people I interviewed as part of my research talked about how they're this hodgepodge of things that aren't supposed to go together. And there's a certain kind of cool comfort that polymaths tend to adopt um, and, and they're able to live in a state of paradox. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I want to introduce you to my two special guests today, but before I do that, I want to let you know how I know them. So about a year ago, the three of us and, and others, but the three of us were at a coach certification program through the Academy of Creative Coaching. And so we spent four days, was it four days together in Maryland? And um, one day, one morning before we were going to get started, I, I overheard Keegan and Danielle talking about polymathy. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wrote my dissertation on this topic. And so this sort of opened a, a really interesting discussion and we've kept in touch over the year. And so that's how I met them. Now, Danielle or Keegan, whoever wants to go first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, like your hodgepodge and your multifaceted experiences? So just so we have a sense of who you guys are and your background. Danielle, do you want to go first? Okay, yeah, sure. sure. So I, um, in, in my high school career, I was very interested in a lot of different topics. Uh, the life sciences primarily, as well as the arts, but I also ended up taking about seven years of foreign language. So I liked all of these things. Um, my mother was very much wanting to direct me in a way that was gonna make me successful. Um, she'd had a very difficult life, and so she had her own ideas of what I should be doing. I ended up starting college with a major in nursing and planned to go through with my master's program. I had a career path, and by the end of my first year of college, I gave birth to my daughter and had changed my major to social work. I ended up with an art degree. So <laughs> that some of that I do, um, I give my daughter some credit for my polymathy because I think that... Um, you have to adapt to what you have. By the age of 21, I owned a house, which meant I ended up, um, was very blessed in, you know, in my career. From there, I ended up in marketing and admin, which that those um, handful of corporations that I worked for um, left me with software development, construction management, uh, writing resumes and producing RFPs for the government. It kind of gave me a real diversity in um, my corporate resume. And I really felt like I could do almost anything. And I've always been that person that had the job, the little side job or part-time job and the hobbies. And we've talked about Angela, how full life experiences is what the goal is. And 
I always felt if I wanted to experience something, I should just go experience it. You know, whether that meant um, take a course, buy a book, or make a new friend and find a mentor. So I have um, over the 20 some years of um, exploring who I am, I've done marketing, admin, um, I was an art teacher, a PE teacher, I taught computer applications and typing. I've been a personal trainer. I am a yoga teacher focusing on functional movement. I uh, have studied religion and cult economics. Um, and through all of it, I've been a business owner and most recently coaching. So it's always been whatever it is you want, chase it. It's, and, uh, and then once you find what you love, help others chase what they want. Beautiful. Thank you, Danielle. All right, Keegan, what about you? What is your hodgepodge? What is your mixture? Yeah, um, I guess I'll try to explain it in a simple way. My story is a story of curiosity, right? If I had to explain who I was or boil it down to one word, it'd be curiosity. And it showed up at a very early age in ways that got me in trouble, right? Don't put the crayon in the sharpener. Okay, why? Puts crayon in sharpener, right? <laughs> Don't do this. Don't touch this stuff. Okay, why? You know, um, and luckily, <laughs> I didn't get in too much trouble and, and um, I stuck around for it to show up in more positive ways, but that is really the spirit of sort of my story. Um, so growing up, I've always, I've, I played all the sports, soccer, track, basketball, um, and I was always passionately curious about music and things, um, fashion, all those type of things, I'm half Jamaican. Um, as well. So culture and people became a part of my life very early on. I was fascinated by how or why people do things. Um, and the first answer given by anyone, including my mother, uh, often wasn't good enough, right? I needed the, the after the fourth or fifth why, right? That, that answer was probably more accurate for me. And where that led me was uh, on a sort of a crusade to become a business person. But along the way, I found um, creativity. Um, and so as far as my adult life, I've worked in many careers. I've worked in commercial and residential real estate. I've worked in corporate retail. Um, I've worked in most recently tech, advertising and marketing. Um, and I'm a painting artist that I, I've been painting for maybe four years now, but publicly only about a year, year and a half. I, I painted in private, right? It was not something I considered a part of my lifestyle. And I would say maybe up until um, 22 or 23, I only showed the world things that fit into the persona that I sort of presented, right? I wanted to be a business person. I wore suits. I didn't talk about art. I didn't talk about music as much. I talked about business deals and mergers and acquisitions in the stock market because that fit the perception I had of myself. Um, and then around uh, sort of 22, 23, I started to welcome in the other aspects of myself that I cherished in private, but hid in public. And I think that's when I really stepped into sort of the full version of myself that's still evolving um, and unleashed or sort of gave myself the permission to be curious all the time, even in front of other people. Um, and then so that leads me where I am today. Uh, I love to travel and experience like Danielle said, uh, I think the best way um, to learn is just to go spend time with other people in other cultures um, to understand different ways of life than your own or the people around you know. Um, and currently I still work in tech in, um, in digital advertising and marketing. I'm a painting artist. I'm working on my third solo show now. Um, and also working on speaking projects. I, I understand that my voice is one of the gifts from the higher powers, whichever higher power you support or believe in. Um, and so I try to cherish that and use that to help other people like Danielle said as well. But, um, but to sum that all up, it's just a very long, complicated story of curiosity. Good way of putting it. Thank you, Keegan. And I'll add to, I also love traveling and seeing the world and learning about ourselves that way. And uh, in the past year since I met Keegan, he has been in California, New Jersey, Mexico, and soon to be Atlanta. So he, when he says he likes to see other, other ways of uh, other cultures and other people, he, he means it. All right, so these are our special guests today. Let me provide you guys an overview of how the session's gonna go. Um, so Keegan and Danielle and I are gonna have a discussion for, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour or something like that. 
Then we will have breakout rooms. You will be sent to breakout rooms to discuss with a few other people what you've heard and what you think. After you come back from the breakout rooms, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. And then um, we'll do the takeaways. So if you feel comfortable, you can share sort of what you got out of this session. Then we'll wrap up. All right. I'd like to share with you all, um, since we're talking about the paradox of Polly Nathy, a few paragraphs, two paragraphs from my dissertation. Um, part of the formula when you write uh, a phenomenological dissertation, as I did, is there's a statement where you basically talk about the essence of the phenomenon you studied. So I had to condense and synthesize everything I had studied into two paragraphs. Okay, it was a challenge. But I want to read these two paragraphs to you guys because it really gets at some of the paradox issues that we're going to be talking about today. So please bear with me while I read you these two paragraphs. Polymath experience taken on the whole. Uh, okay, so it's being a, mo being a modern day polymath requires a certain type of free spirit. One that does not fit conveniently within a single box. A polymath is a person who loves to learn. A polymath values freedom which shows up in the form of forging one's own singular path in life. A polymath is brave to explore his or her unique journey, mostly on their own. So a polymath is someone who can pave his or her own way professionally and otherwise. A polymath is someone who is somewhat rebellious beneath the surface, refusing to live life as a narrow specialist as society might prefer for them to be. A polymath has confidence to boldly explore the many various parts of his or her personhood and the resilience to withstand the challenges involved in that endeavor. A polymath may also experience a life with contradictions. A polymath may have career paths and or hobbies that appear contradictory on the surface. A polymath is someone who gets their sense of identity as a polymath from not fitting in, but by being different. A polymath is someone who can connect with almost anybody over myriad subjects and yet never truly feels like they fit in with any single group. A polymath is someone who is quite confident but may also feel imposter syndrome at times, yet does not allow that to stop them in their pursuit for internal diversification. A polymath is someone who seeks to deeply understand the world they live in, but who rarely feels under well understood by others in return. A polymath may obtain the most impactful parts of his or her education outside of formal schooling as he or she self-directs their own learning journeys. This is what it, like, it feels like to be a polymath. It is a rich experience, but it is hard at times and it is full of contradictions. The true essence of a polymath is a desire to expand, never shrink. Polymathy is about fully savoring life with zest wanting to make the most of this human experience in all its rich variations and striations, the good, the bad, all of it. Polymaths have an openness to experience. In fact, this is essentially an openness to life itself. They are self-directed learners committed to lifelong learning and personal growth. A polymath in essence strives for self-mastery through various forms and combinations, each polymath unique in his or her own right. So if I had to boil down what I learned about polymaths, that would be it. Okay, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Hopefully, hopefully that wasn't too arduous to listen to. All right, so my first question for Danielle and Keegan is, in your particular cases, what are the parts of your personality that society, society would say aren't supposed to go together that seem paradoxical if someone were looking at you from the outside? I, I, so I am known as being an artist and a yogi. I'm a yoga teacher. I practice yoga regularly and I'm a professional painter. And I have found that most people find it surprising that I'm good at business, mm. that I should not be so able to be so structured or organized. I shouldn't understand profit and loss statements. I, <laughs> and under it is, um, I wouldn't say I'm rigid by any means. And I would definitely agree that, you know, 20 over 20 years of exploring who I am 
in a polymathic sense has definitely given me the ability to create systems and organization that allow me to be a lifelong learner and explore and study and be productive in a way that makes me happy. But even as early as like last year, I had someone tell me that they couldn't believe that I was able to run a yoga business successfully because yogis aren't supposed to be able to do that or painters and creatives aren't supposed to be able to do that. And having been in the business world for a long time, I will admit that it does help if you're very specific and narrow in your business focus. So that is something that I try to balance um, from a marketing aspect. When it's time to market may not be the time to tell everybody all the things I know how to do. I may need to target a little bit. So I have taken all my polymathy interests but they all could be narrowed almost. So that's somewhat of a paradox, mm -hmm. taking a generalist, but allowing to specify specific, each area. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, and also I just wanna mirror back, like society would say, well, how can you be this like expressive artist, this yoga person, this spiritual person and be like organized and a business person and, on, and right. super, super on top of your, stuff you know yeah. that's not supposed to go together but here it is danielle is an example of how that does go together for her i tell people i'm a type a hippie <laughs> i love, love and flowers and let's have fun but let's do it right <laughs> yeah <You know? laughs> i love that i love that all right keegan what about you what what parts of your identity would society say aren't supposed to go together but that do in your case Did we lose him? Oh, um, he can't unmute himself. Uh, let's see. Keegan. Um, Shrikant, can you help unmute got Keegan? Oh, there it. It. Okay. Sorry, I, I got uh, I fell off. And then I think when I came back in, the permissions were changed. Oh, OK, OK. Um, so I actually, I'll agree with Danielle on part of my answer. It's twofold. So the first part is um, whenever someone asks me to describe myself in a professional setting, I always use the word suit and creative. Those are sort of like those historical terms to define people in like the 50s and 60s, whether you're watching like a, like a madman, you're either this sort of high in the sky creative that doesn't really have a concept of timelines, or you're this very rigid business person that is just all about the numbers and nothing else matters, right? Like there are two boxes, you fit into one, pick, pick it, you know, and, and move forward. And I've kind of split my time in both of those categories. And so, um, like Danielle said, it's weird. Someone's looking to basically put you in one of those boxes. And when you don't completely fit, there's like a disconnect. Like, why? why? Why are you doing this? And then that sort of leads into the second part, this idea of focus and concentration, um, I think is often associated with time around one thing, right? So you're focused if you spend all of your time doing one thing. And that's just something that I've never really associated with. I think um, what allows people to be able to innovate and create within specific um, domains is to step outside of the domain mm -hmm. somewhere else, experience something different and then come back into it with a fresh perspective. So I think the, uh, the reality of being a suit and a creative at the same time has been something that's like odd for others to accept. And then the second part is spending so much time in different disciplines can, can sometimes make people believe that I'm unfocused or I don't have the ability to commit to something, but it all stems back to this idea of curiosity and what you do with the information you got from this other area and how you apply it to the domain you're currently in. Yeah. Suit and creative. And then Danielle, what was your something hippie? Type A hippie. Type A hippie. Oh my gosh. I love that. Type A hippie and suit and creative. That says it all. All right. My next question for you guys is because you have these combinations that people don't expect there, I would assume are times when you explain your identity and you, you explain your capabilities and your background to someone, maybe someone you're just meeting and they're surprised or, or maybe it's someone you've known over time, but you just let little bits of your identity out and then you go, Oh yeah. And I ride motorcycles and they go, what, you know what I mean? I know you guys know what I mean. <laughs> So I'm curious that element of surprise that your personhood elicits in other people's like, 
what kind of reactions do you get from people when you explain the various facets of your identity? I think in some ways it depends on their identity and their context of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you have to be a chameleon and almost listen for a moment and be like, okay, is this person going to think my polymathy is cool or, and useful, or is this person going to get confused and therefore forget me? You know, what do, what do I want from them? What do they want from me? And I don't mean that from a selfish standpoint because maybe I want friendship from them and they want friendship from me and that's very clear. And if that's the case, okay, polymathy could be cool. But if I'm talking about someone and say, we're discussing, you know, their low back pain and I do private therapeutic yoga sessions and I'm, you know, I want to help them in that way. Do they really need to know I sold a painting yesterday that I don't want to, you know, it's almost like, let's, you have to just listen and decide what do you need to share in some people, you almost have to be famous before you can let them know all the things you know how to do because then they know, like, and trust you based on, okay, this is a great yoga teacher that understands how my body works. It's really okay that she also knows how to paint and cook and could just, you know, debate religion with me. You know, it, it's just, sometimes you have to, you got to hope and wait, you know? Yeah. So you sort of feel it out. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that, um, Jennifer from Chicago put in the chat. It's very much about taking the temperature of the person. Yeah. Yes. And that is definitely something I heard from my participants with regard to their identity is that there's a lot of actual censorship and sort of letting things out in bits. And then if you let a little bit too much out or if or maybe you let something out on, on purpose just to see what kind of mm -hmm. surprise they'll get, because that's sort of fun. That can be fun to yeah. you know, get that reaction. <laughs> and I see Madeline commented on stereotypes, and that's something that I have really felt like from something as trivial as that I'm blonde to the artist and yogi, there's no way I could possibly know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. So, right. Keegan, what about for you? What kind of reactions do you get when you sort of reveal the full portfolio of your personhood? I think the conversation always almost immediately gets rooted towards age. And it becomes like a, how old are you? It's okay. the first question I get all the time. How old are you? And I think it's because there, there are certain concepts we have about like how long things take to do or like when, when you're old enough to be able to execute something or you know be a part of something and it doesn't necessarily fit into the box of all the things you mentioned. And so I think like naturally as uh, like our brain is always trying to comprehend whatever's in front of us, right? Like this is what I understand. You're introducing something new. I need to be able to put it into like one of the existing boxes in my head. And like the nine things you just mentioned as well as you looking like you're fairly young don't make sense. So I'm trying to make sense of it, right? So it gets rooted in age. Um, and I mean, I, I think for me, I've never necessarily associated with the have to's or like shoulds. I've tried to stay away from it. Like, okay, I have to be in this for this amount of time to be able to do this, or I should do this. Um, Cause it's essentially just trying to like mirror whatever's existed in the past instead of trying new things out, right? We're experimenting with new things. Um, and then the only other thing I want to mention, I see there's a question or a statement here about how these sort of stereotypes arose specifically about artists being flaky or not running their own businesses. I think there's a conversation to be had about the effects of um, capitalism or very strong capitalism in this country and what that, um, the effect that has on everything else that's not associated with business, right? It creates this lens of like, this is how you make money and this is the only way and it has to be super scalable. Um, and we have to have an idea of how we can make millions of dollars. And if it doesn't do that, then it's not necessarily the American form of capitalism, right? It's scale, um, it's big, it's uh, rich, it's wealth, right? But I think historically there are many, many examples of businesses before this version of capitalism that were very much rooted in balance and um, sustainability and sort of incremental growth instead of massive scale. So I think artists don't fit into this sort of like massive scale idea of capitalism. Interesting, thank you, Keegan. Um, so I know one of my prior questions was, so what are the parts of your identity that society would say don't go together? But I'm curious if in your own mind, 
they do go together and if there's some story around how they go together that fits i know for you keegan you already said it's all just curiosity right so that's that's that may be the answer to this question for you but what comes up for you guys like what if you had to i don't want to say put yourself in a box but if because we don't like doing that right but if you had to kind of summarize the hodgepodge and and the different facets in in a story what would your summation be I think it's all, yes, your personhood, so it automatically makes sense, you know, but also it's all for me, health and wellness. If you take, let's say you're eating right and you're exercising and your goal is uh, to travel, that um, it's probably might be easier if you like, you want to climb Machu Picchu, it certainly helps to be ready for that and, uh, you know, eating food that's going to give you stamina and um, getting sleep at night and all that, you're going to be better at traveling and that kind of back and forth. But um, what if you are focused completely, you are eating right and you are exercising right, but you're going to work and you do not like your job. It makes you miserable. You have, you know, stomach ache, you know, your, your nervous system's in a state of like fight or flight. It, you know, you, therefore you don't sleep at night. Therefore your workouts aren't as productive and you're snappish with your spouse and your kids, you know, you're, you're short with them. That, it needs to be a continuous cycle. And I feel in my work when health and wellness, it's all one thing. So I eat right. I don't eat perfect, but I eat right. I stay movement and active. And then I'm a painter. I'm learning to play the guitar right now. I read books because that learning fulfills me. It's all that. Um, if you, you know, it's all mental health in a way. Can you imagine that you're exercising and you're eating right, but you don't ever chase your dreams or you chase your dreams and you live off of fast food? How long are you going to be able to chase them? You know, it's all <laughs> this big, it's all that. And I, I meet people that um, I always wanted to do this, but I didn't because of, well, I was raising kids or I always wanted to do that, but I couldn't because I had to provide an income. So there's this longing and this feeling of like, I'm not doing what I want to do or I was meant to do. And I'm like, why did society told you you had to have one job at a time? Um, so I work a lot with my clients. Um, time management is an easy thing to call it, but strategic life planning. If you were in control of your schedule, what would it look like? And how can we use this time that we have been given to make sure we are as efficient as possible so that we can do all the things that we want to do. And it, so for me, if I'm helping you get fit and eat right, I also want to know, well, what else do you want, Angela? Because if, if you're, I, it's great that if you're eating right and exercising, but if your dream is to, you know, climb Machu Picchu, you're not going to be fulfilled. So how can I help you set that goal meaning set up the bank account, research the travel agencies, you know, start what's add walking and hill climbing to your routine. Let's do everything we can to make sure that you have the ability to reach all the goals, even if they don't seem related. They are because I'm here to help you be the best person. Megan, what about you? Is there a common thread um, throughout your, your identity or do you feel like you just embrace these contradictions and can't quite find a common thread through it all. Yeah, I think um, I think the common thread is impact, but I will I'll expound on that a little bit more. I think when it comes to doing things well, this there's this idea that you need to be the best at it, right? Like that's the standard form of impact. If you do something, you should do it to be the best at it or to make the most money at it or to be the most successful in that in that way. And um, I think what is the same about all of my experiences, all of my professions, all of the things that I've stepped into is that the idea of impact isn't specific to this idea of making a lot of money or being the best in comparison to others. It's about bringing something specific to that table to that experience to that, you know, ecosystem. And so when I think about impact, I don't think I've ever been the very best comparing myself to others at anything I've ever done in life. And I can say that honestly, and I can say that in a very kind way to myself that doesn't hurt my feelings. 
Um, Cause I don't think my intention is to step inside the ecosystem, assess everyone else and decide my goal here is to be just better than you. Like that, that's not my sort of approach. My approach is I probably have a specific unique set of skills or experiences that other people might not have. And I bring something to this ecosystem that no one else does, right? So that's my impact. So whether it was sports um, uh, or jobs or anything like that, there's something I bring to the table, um, but I don't always know what it's gonna be, right? It's not always gonna be, okay, Keegan gonna step in and be the best at this. It might be Keegan brought a system that didn't exist in this domain from art or from real estate or from corporate something or fashion, right? And we didn't think it applied, but it does apply. So that was the impact. Or Keegan's purpose on this team was to make sure that everyone else around him who are very interested in being the best at one specific thing, achieve that goal, right? Like that's my impact. And so that impact changes based on like where I'm at and what I'm doing. And I think that's the commonality between all the experiences. Whereas I think when you're younger um, and you're sort of being molded by teachers and you know the, the community or the village, there's this lingering idea that if you do something, it should only be to be the best at it. All right, thank you, Keegan. My next question um, has to do with how did you figure out you were polymathic? And I wanna share one of the more interesting takeaways from my dissertation um, after I interviewed all these very strong polymathic people is I heard from them that they realized they were polymathic because they couldn't really fit in comfortably in any group. Like they could partially fit in, in lots of groups but they couldn't really feel like, uh, like they, they, they're they like, oh, I'm a, I'm a polymath because I found a group of polymaths. Because the, the fact is, most people don't know that word. We don't really talk about it. We don't really appreciate it. We live in an age of specialization. So what's interesting is that polymaths found their identity as such because they couldn't really find a place where they really fit in. And by the way, that's why I, I created Polymaths Place the Facebook group and the YouTube channel because I was trying to give them a place. I'm still trying to give them a place. But I just want to say too that social identity is a person's knowledge that he or she belongs to a social category or group. So polymaths can tend to find lots of uh, out groups where they don't really fit in. They can find some in groups where they partially fit in, but they, they never really found necessarily like they, they found their tribe because the fact is too that every polymath is so unique. So it is a singular journey to some extent. I'm curious if this resonates with you. Like, did you feel like you learned you were polymathic because you just couldn't fit in that one box? You couldn't find a singular box? Or, I mean, how did you, how did you figure out you were this way? I, inver I don't know that I figured it out early on I guess for a while I just thought I get bored quickly <laughs> I I um let's do something different but um I I owned a business in Virginia that was um I it was an art studio and art gallery um I sold my artwork and I taught painting and but I was at the same time a corporate chef and event designer so read art and design, ran the art studio, did the event design work for my corporate client. And then I had subcontractors underneath me that provided graphic design, web design, and interior design. So it was, you could walk in the door and get all of your art and design needs. Well, I was doing yoga and I realized that the way yoga made me feel was very similar to the way making art made me feel. So I started my grad work and I created my program artistic meditation. Essentially you're meditating while you're painting uh, through a daily art practice. And I ended up reading in grad school, Dr. Um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work of flow theory. And that really was like, wow, I, that's what I do. And I do it in multiple areas of my life, almost this obsessive moment. And he compared the nine elements of flow theory to the eight limbs of yoga. And it was like, holy cow, he wrote a book about me. <laughs> uh, 
And um, it was right about that time that someone sent me a TED talk from Emily Wappernack. And of course, then from there, I read her book and then she suggested other books. And what I really liked about Emily was she just explained it regular. It was just a great stepping stone that you could then kind of like share with other people. It wasn't too scholarly. It was just right to kind of like get you into it to understand things. So um, yeah, I guess a, a combination of uh, grad school and that TED talk is probably around the same time. Keegan, what about you? How did you figure out or how did you gain self-awareness that like this is who you are, this is part of your identity? Yeah, um, the, so the, the idea of like not fitting in is, is something that I, I think I'm close to, but in a very different way than it's often talked about, right? You have this idea of like, oh, I'm like a square peg trying to fit into like a circle hole or something like that, right? And most of my experiences, I've actually been enough alike all of the spaces I've been in to not feel so much like another, but different enough for myself in that environment to notice that we're not exactly the same. I don't know if that really makes sense. You understand what I'm trying to say? I think so. So uh, in all of those experiences, I was enough like them to where I didn't feel like an outsider or I didn't feel like I, you know, um, I wasn't accepted, but there was always some unique aspect about me that they always wondered, like, where did you Where'd you get that? It's like, imagine that if we're all cars, everything was the same about me, but I just had different wheels. So we all functioned the same, we all drove on roads, but there would always be this question like, Keegan, where'd you get those wheels from? Like, I've never seen those before, right? There was, instead of 80% of me being different than everyone, 20% of me has been different. But I've always been able to connect with people on like an 80% level, no matter what environment I've been in. And so I realized that, um, I would consider myself a polymath because I never felt that I had one group that I was 100% like. I think most people would consider their best friends just like them. Um, the groups they spend their times with, they're, they're like the same people. They love the same music. They go to the same places. We hang out at the same bars. We do the same things because we're so much alike. I have like a limit of like 50, 60, 70, 80% with a lot of folks, enough to build strong relationships and build a connection. There's, but there's always a remaining 20% that I, that's different. And I always wondered like why, um, I have a lot of acquaintances, people that I've built pretty good relationship with, but they're not best friends, right? right? They're not really good friends. There are a lot of people I've experienced and have experienced myself throughout this. We know enough about each other to know names and birthdays and to call each other randomly, right? But we don't speak every day. Um, I've worked with people, I've played sports, you're right, all of these experiences, enough to build strong relationships, but not enough to say, hey, we're just like each other, let's do all of these things together. And when I got to that point, I realized, hey, no matter what environment I step into, there's a part of me that's similar to this. And I'm not changing myself, like, I step into a room and I have heard that music before because I'm curious, or I have been to that state or that country before because I'm curious. Um, and so I realized, hey, this, this like limit, not in a negative way, but this limit on being just like someone else makes me feel that there has to be a way to describe it. And that's when I stumbled on the term. Awesome. That's a good lead into my next question. Since Keegan, you were talking about sort of your socially, like what percentage can you sort of find common ground with people? And so one of the uh, paradoxes of polymathy, which was in that little two paragraph statement I read at the very beginning, is that it's so easy for someone with a broad toolkit and with so many diverse experiences to find common ground. You meet someone and you go, oh, you like painting? Me too. Let's talk about painting. You know, there's just more of that stuff you can pull from. So you can find common ground and, and when you meet someone, you can find a way to connect. That was what I heard from the people I interviewed. But that's also counterbalanced with this feeling of like, man, I never really fit in. Like I never find that group where I'm like, oh, we are just so simpatico and, you know, so there's this like, I, I can, I can find common ground, I can understand, oh man, but I can't find my place, like, I can't find my tribe that's kind of hard because it's such a singular journey and 
I don't really feel like people understand me in all my facets very well. Like I, I want to understand others, but then I'm not very well understood in, in return. So socially, like the social aspects of being polymathic is a, it's a kind of a paradox in a way, you know, I, I can, I can understand, but I can't be understood very well, or I, I can find common ground and, and connection, but I can't really fit in that well. Does this resonate with you guys? Does this fit with your experiences? I, yeah, actually, uh, this question, it doesn't, I don't know how, it doesn't bother me, but I almost feel like I, I love people. And like you said, I'm in the room, I'm having a great experience, I'm partying, I'm connecting, I'm then, and then all of a sudden there's this wall. Number one, I'm tired and I'm very done and I need to go home and do my things. I, <laughs> but also, I don't know my ability to bond with people if it's, it's a very limited number of people. And the bonding that I have if I look back over my life and I name the handful of people that I felt I bond with, while if they called me today in an emergency, I would go, I don't know that I miss them. And that sounds very cold and I'm not trying to be because I really do care about people. It's my, my career is very much in caring for people and being a compassionate source of comfort and, and helping them problem solve what they're going through. But I, at the end of the day, I want to be alone. And my bond is with um, the very, very closest people with, you know, my children and my, um, my husband, it's just, um, yeah, I, I'm going to have fun, but I'm going to get tired. And I don't know, after that, is that I don't know, I'm not gonna say all polymaths are anti, you know, don't have bonds. But <laughs> that's my experience. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I can get the wall. I don't know. <laughs> I Keegan, what, what about you? Um, you know, I mean, you already touched upon like kind of mm -hmm. the social challenges, but any other thoughts on like the, the paradoxical aspects of, you know, how polymathy really kind of plays out in social settings? Yeah, I am. Um, so like Danielle, I'm a, I'm a big people person. I, I love people. Um, and I think for myself, I've only been able to share sort of like that entire, like we love everything, we talk about everything together with like a significant other, like my significant other, right? Like that's been the only person, I have groups of friends, um, but often those conversations vary, right? Like I don't talk to you about everything. Sometimes I talk about this, sometimes I talk about that. Sometimes you come to me for this, you know, vice versa. Um, but it sort of feels like, um, I don't know, it sort of feels like I'm a, I'm a cubby like, you, you know, in kindergarten, when you're going and everyone had like a cubby. Yes. Right? It feels like I'm like a collection of cubbies and all of my relationships fit into these different boxes. Um, not in like a negative way, but um, that's how we interact or that's how people interact with me. And there, there's a connection there, it's strong. And I don't necessarily need it to be more or less, right? I don't require, there are some people I speak to maybe once a year. And the one time we speak, we have very meaningful half an hour conversations that fill my cup and it fills theirs. And I don't require it to be more. I don't judge that it's not more because I don't, I don't need you to be a best friend of mine to be an acquaintance or a really good friend or, or colleague. Um, and I sort of move through life that way. So it sort of ties back into this idea of like, there's enough of a connection between us for it to be meaningful in a unique way. But I think there's only like one person on a day-to-day -day basis that I'm able to connect with across all fronts, go to with everything, they come to me with everything. Whereas some of the people I grew up with in high school or college, they have a group of friends, right? Uh, four or five folks that they go to, they talk about everything. If they're going to eat, everyone goes to eat. If they're going out, everyone goes out. And I've never really had that experience. And there was a time where I sort of yearned for it because everyone else, or I felt like everyone else had it. But now I have a deep understanding of like, how I interact with the world and I appreciate it. And I just try to remind myself to cherish the relationship, any relationship for what it is, no matter what it is. Uh, Keegan, oh, Danielle, go ahead. I just love that you said cubbies. I often say my brain is like a waffle. 
<laughs> some people have spaghetti brains and some people have waffle brains. And I have, it's, I don't know, compartmentalization is probably cold, but it's like, no, you're just in this box over here. And if you stay in that square, sometimes you put syrup on the, it gets a little squishy, but, but for the most part, everything's very separate. And that is very, that's comforting. It's still organizational. <laughs> Keegan, I just want to say too, you know, thank you for sharing about your significant other. And you're so fortunate that you have this person that you can, you know, be close with and share everything with. I feel like it could be its own session alone, like day day, like for people who are single <laughs> and are looking for that someone as this hodgepodge of myriad, uh, you know, personality traits or capabilities that aren't supposed to go together. Um, navigating single life can be difficult. That's what I heard from my participants. So for those of you who have found a wonderful partner who, who you can share all of yourself with, that is wonderful. All right, another paradox of Polly Mathy is that they seem on the, on the, for the most part on the surface, they come across as very confident people. They're doing things usually, they're learning, they're able to express their ideas and have opinions. They're learners. You know, these are people who are impressive. At the same time, one of the things I heard from more than half of my participants was they feel this kind of imposter syndrome because they have not been a neuro specialist to be a real expert in one thing alone. They haven't spent their whole life with sort of blinders on becoming a neuro specialist that when they compare themselves to people who have done that, there's a sort of like insecurity that can pop up. Um, and so this is another paradox that like, they're capable, they're intelligent, they're confident, and they're insecure at the same time. So I'm curious, do, what do you guys think of that? Like, does that resonate in your case or what comes up for you guys? Absolutely, 100%. And that is paradoxically hard to say. <laughs> Because I am confident and I don't want anybody to know, but yeah, yes. And I often wonder if it's because I was that I got pregnant as a teenager. So my whole path of like, I was supposed to go to college, I was supposed to get my master's degree. I was going to do this one thing. And I had to go very roundabouty because I had a child to care for, um, eventually got married. I had a mortgage. So it, um, yes. So it, I, I do just when I think I'm not deserving or I'm not good at this, what I often find is because I'm a lifelong learner, I'll be listening to a book and the amazing validation that comes and I'm like, oh, I do that. Or, you know, I'm, I'm an anatomy nerd. I spend a lot of time studying anatomy and I'll review a book and I'll remember like, oh, I'm doing it right. You know, I'm, it's just the, con I don't want to say that I need to be constantly like, encouraged in some way, but somehow when I'm just, when I'm feeling like this is crazy, something will be reinforced because of the lifelong learning that shows me that I am in the right path. I am doing it right. You are important, whatever. So, mm -hmm. but I do, I definitely um, feel that. Mm -hmm. Keegan, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's spot on. Um, Again, the past couple of years, this has been a big, I wouldn't call it a struggle, I would call it a project process for me. This has been something that has absolutely showed up in the, my professional career. And I think it stems from the need to compare to others, right? Like everyone else is a specialist in something and they're really good at it. And that's how we determine worth in, in corporate America, right? Like, oh, you're good at something, you've achieved this metric, you've achieved this KPI, okay, great. So then we can now grant you this sort of persona of being valuable, right? Like that's, that's the trajectory, how we get there. You're good at something, you prove it, you excel, and then we say you're good. And we say we like that you're good. And then, then we get self-esteem, right? And I'm like still, I had to start, but I'm still working. Like how do you break that cycle to find what your impact is? And using impact instead of greatness or success, what is your impact? It's like, um, if you were to look at the sun, the sun is valuable. The sun is great without having to talk about the fact that it like replenishes plants and we get energy from it. And, you know, all of these other things, the specific things that it's good at and that it does to benefit us. It's great even before talking about those things. So being that patient with myself, um, I've had to work through because I would uh, historically attach my worth to being very good at one specific thing so that everyone else could validate it. 
and say, okay, great. Like now we can say you're good. Um, but now it's, it's more of a prog, uh, it's more of a process of, I understand that this entire ecosystem is set up a specific way. Um, but I am who I am, right? So if I'm hired for a job to do one specific thing, I'm going to do that pretty well, but there's also going to be other things that you're going to get from me. And those things might be more important. And so I have to stay true to myself to be able to do what you hired me for, but also be patient and open enough to unleash the other things that I have to offer. Um, I was watching a movie, I, I guess this is a great way to tie it together. I was watching a movie and a very successful business person hired an assistant to handle his business affairs. And one of the quotes in the movies was, you, you hired someone to handle your affairs, but you got someone that saved your life in a way that had nothing to do with your business, right? So I remind myself of that, that you know sometimes we are requested or we are invited to do something specific, but something else sometimes more profound happens. And I think as a polymath or just someone who has a lot of different interests and experiences, you have to be open enough with yourself to, um, to let whichever one of those things might be the prevailing impact. Yeah. And Keegan, I just want to respond to something you said. There's kind of this mix of like, and I, I this probably applies to like every human being, not just polymathic types, but there's this mix of like caring what other people think, but then not caring what they think. And that's another paradox is like on any given issue. Am I going to care? Am I going to care what they want from me? Or am I going to do my own thing and be, you know, independent and free? So absolutely another paradox. All right, my next question has to do with, so both of you have, you know, business experience, you, ha you have both been successful artists, and I'm curious, you know, in those different domains, there's kind of a different language, a different ethos, a different value sets, you know, someone who's a painter versus someone who's a Googler, there are going to be different value sets probably showing up um, in those domains, and so I'm curious how you kind of navigate these different um, values that are associated with the different hats you wear. Um, how do you navigate those different worlds that have different languages and different different values? I get, you know, sometimes I don't know. How do we learn a language? I get, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know, you're raised in this language almost, so you're just learning it. I. I I, you know, I guess I was never when I owned my art studio, you know, a lot of times people they say, well, you have to paint what you're feeling, you have to express yourself. Um, my daughter, who's also an artist, you know, um, she used to get frustrated because her professors wanted some big meaning about every painting and she was like, no, it's flowers and flowers are pretty and that should be enough. We don't have to attach some meaning to everything that's not necessarily. And I, as a businesswoman, would paint, oh, right now unicorns are hot. Guess what I'm painting? Unicorns, because then I'll be able to sell them, you know, <laughs> and that can be very cold in the art world to some people. Um, yeah, if you're not, you know, emotion, I guess, um, yeah. I don't know if I hit that. It is, um, yeah, being a type A hippie. I don't know. I can't figure it out. I don't know. <laughs> type A hippie. I love it. Keegan, what about you? Like what comes up when you think about like the different um, languages or different value sets or, you know, I think you called it the, the suit and the creative, you know, when you go from suit to creative or from creative to suit, do you, does it, is it a smooth transition? I mean, how do you navigate those two worlds? Cause you're part of both. Yeah. I think Danielle mentioned it earlier. She said, you have to be like a chameleon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a delicate balance because you still want to be true to yourself, right? You don't always want to sort of want to mirror everyone you're in front of, cause then you lose who you are when no one else is there. Right. But I think what naturally happens is the experiences, the memory, the knowledge from the domain that I'm in naturally rise to the surface. So if I'm in a business meeting or if I'm talking to managers or even just like executives and corporations, right, I naturally talk about business growth um, and removing barriers and how to effectively scale and keep costs low and, right, like what drives revenue and innovation and technology, like I, I naturally start to talk about those things because I think I, I know that that's the world they're in 
and that's automatically what rises to the surface. Whereas if I'm talking about my art or speaking with other artists, I naturally start talking about elements and tones and palettes and emotional connections and real world events and how all of this applies to the approach and the technique um, and whether it means everything or whether it means nothing, right? And you get lost in this world of like subjectivity. Um, I think it just has to do with <clears throat> the sort of like um, evaluating the environment and the people in the environment that I'm talking to. And I think I'm able to just sort of like pull to the surface the experience I have, the experiences I have that speak to what they're curious about because it might be one or two things. Um, so I don't, I don't know how or why it happens, um, but it's often, I mentioned earlier, like there's like a 60, 70 or 80% of myself that's connected with this person. I just automatically go into that 60, 70, 80% bucket and leave the other 20% for a more explorative conversation or something like that. But I think I, I'm often just trying to, um, be a part of other people's worlds um, and add value to whatever they're interested in. Right. All right, guys. Um, I want to ask a few, I'm going to call this like a lightning round set of questions because we, we need to move on to the breakout rooms, but I want to get some quick responses to three more questions. So just whatever comes up for you. The first question is, do you like the seemingly contradictory or paradoxical parts of your personality, your personhood? And if so, why? Yes. But what I don't like is other people's stereotypes and assumptions. Hmm. Sometimes that gets frustrating. To me, it's just like, meh, no big deal. You are limiting me by assuming. And I have already proven I have no limits. I love that. Keegan, what about you? Do you like this sort of mixture that you are? Do you like being a surprising um, combination of different experiences and capabilities? Yes. Absolutely, and, and because it just leads to new places. Right. Awesome. Next question. Are there any other paradoxical elements of your poly, Matthew, that you'd like to share that haven't come up so far? Anything else on paradox? I've thought of one. Can I share one? Sure. You guys are so unique, just like everyone else. Okay. <laughs> You're unique, just like everyone else. Right. Um, That's I another paradox. One of my uh, answers to your question is, sure, I yam what I yam. <laughs> I love puns, so I went with that. <laughs> Any other uh, sort of observations about how paradox or, or just any thoughts um, before we uh, wrap up this part of our session today? Uh, make it fun. Make it fun. Yeah. Advice for, or, you know, here's another question I'll ask too. Any advice for people who are trying to navigate the paradoxes of their own polymathy? Maybe they're wrestling with, can I be this and this, you know, and this may even show up for someone who's like, can I be, I probably shouldn't say this because maybe people will get upset with me, but can I be Christian and, and gay? Can I be a scientist and an artist? Yeah. I mean, what advice can you give to people? Because there are people struggling with the paradox and the things that aren't supposed to go together that society says, and yet they do for that person. So I'm curious what advice you would give to someone. And this is my final question before we go to the breakout rooms. I, I would say um, don't focus on the things as much as the concepts that sort of fuel how you look at them. I think perspective changes everything. Um, and so if you're asking certain questions of can I be this and can I be that, it's mostly because the two different things you've defined have boxes, predetermined boxes that say you're supposed to be this, or you're supposed to be that. So that's why it's contradictory. So instead of focusing on like, can I be this or can it be that, analyze whatever that box is and who told you it has to be this way. It's almost like if someone said, hey, can you add a room to this house? The assumptions that you have to build up, but we have basements, you can build down. Right. So there's it's it's all about perspective and how you look at things. Um, but I think for myself and, and this is I'm not speaking from a pedestal. This is something I still work on every day. It's just essentially questioning the lens you're evaluating something based on. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's being a good critical thinker to help navigate through the difficulty. Yeah. Danielle, what about you? What advice would you give to someone who might be struggling with like the, the paradox, uh, paradoxes of their own polymathy? 
it would be your experiences like what you know if you've lived in a small town your whole life you have one viewpoint and then when you move somewhere else all of a sudden you realize other things we don't know what we don't know and uh there's nothing wrong with never stop learning. And that's a lot of what I see that polymathy is. It is just lifelong learning. Yeah. There's, you know, a, all different traditional, non-traditional, you know, going back to school or just getting a good book or taking a night class or signing up for some online program. Um, I can tell you that my Facebook feed knows I like learning. Uh, <laughs> and that, you know, it's really um, just lifelong learning and, um, you know, write it down. I really believe in journaling and write it down. And I know someone who has a journal that may help, um, you, um, <laughs> write it down and explore some of these thoughts and see what you can find. That's actually bridging the two things we talked about earlier, how the word bridge, it was such a big deal. Sometimes these things aren't as separate as we think they are. Mm -hmm. Good point. So, Good point. All right, on that note, um, Shrikant, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And guys, as you head into the breakout room, just you know, share what came up for you. What, you know, what observations do you have? Is this resonating with your experience? What do you think about the paradoxes of polymathy? Um, and Shrikant will, I think, review the, the rules as we, or yeah, the Wonderful. next step. Thank you, thank you, uh, Angela, Keegan and Daniel. I really appreciate that. Uh, so folks, we are now going to breakout rooms. The breakout rooms, uh, we are, here are the rules. First, let everybody speak for one to two minutes on what they got from, you know, from the presentation. That way, we, everybody gets to put their thoughts on the table and then, then you follow it up with a discussion. The rules are keep on topic, be brief, be courteous and encourage others to speak. If needed, you can just click on ask for help and I'll help you. All right, um, so we'll run the breakout rooms for 20 minutes after which we'll automatically come back into this main room. And there we'll be sharing takeaways and asking questions. Okay, so you can talk about what you got from the meetup and what burning question you have after discussion with everybody. And everybody will, you know, um, uh, the uh, participants, the, uh, will, uh, the speakers will get to uh, address each of those questions uh, if they want. Okay, so I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Give me just a second. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right, so now it's time for takeaways and questions. So the way it works is we've got, uh, you know, the same four rules that we always have. Uh, number one, in order to speak, go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. And uh, Keegan, uh, Daniel and um, Angela, what I would recommend, keep yourself muted. Whenever you want to respond to anybody, just unmute yourself. So I know that you want to respond and I will call on you, okay? So folks, uh, go ahead and uh, type an exclamation mark for sharing your takeaways. We want to hear what, what you got from this meetup. And so you can either do just takeaway or you can do just question, or you can do a takeaway and a question. All right, so we'll start with Barry followed by Kevin. Barry. Well, my big takeaway is I think I found my tribe. I've been looking for this. I've been, it's like I've been searching all my life for this lost tribe. I've been to the Amazon forest. I've been to uh, New York forest, and I've been to the uh, rural areas, and, and now I found them on Zoom. And so, uh, thank you, Angela, for bringing your, my tribe to me in my living room or in my basement. Uh, my big takeaway is I'm big on integration right now. I'm big on uh, disintegrating segregation and integrating integration. And uh, so I'm right now doing my yoga and I'm uh, using flashcards to help me remember my yoga poses, but also using flashcards to help me remember uh, playing different songs. And so I'm uh, interested in exploring and I uh, have questions about how other polymaths integrate their diverse interests, because I think that's where the fun is. And I think this is why it's great to be paradoxical, 
because paradoxical makes it more interesting and the paradoxical gives you an honor opportunity to integrate things that are in conflict with each other. And that is the most exciting thing about life is to find connections to things that seem on the surface disconnected. Wonderful, Barry, um, I want to respond to you first. Um, we're doing a meetup just on this. We are going to be on this Comprehensivist Wednesdays. We are going to, the theme is to look at, there is a paper by John Boyd called Destruction and Creation. How do you operate in a fast changing world where there is a lot of unknowns and a lot of new things that you're coming across? How do you destroy and recreate your entire worldview and conceptual structures as you go along. So it is an epistemological paper about how, and it is a fundamental paper which has really transformed the way in which US military fights. So it is a really, really something. Uh, so look forward to that. Angela, you're next. <laughs> yeah, I just, Barry, thank you. I'm so glad that, that you found this group and you found your tribe. That really warms my heart. Um, and I love that you said, you talked about integration because the, the, the measurements of Pauli Matthew, Michael Rocky writes about this a lot is there's depth, how, how much expertise does someone have in any given thing? There's, there's breadth, how much variety are they knowledgeable or skilled in? And then there's integration, like can you apply lessons or tools from one area to another domain? And that's where the creativity and the innovation can really be born. I love how you said integration is disintegrating segregation. That, I mean, it's like, say that 10 times fast. Um, one thing I want to say, point out, like one way, one way that you can um, to integrate a tool that you can use is analogical thinking. It's, it's taking approaches or or methods from one area, and even if they haven't been used in some new field before, actively just trying it. So that's one tool you could use. I love that you said paradox is more interesting. I agree. And that if things are in conflict and you can connect them, like that's where you're gonna get some interesting results. I totally agree. Anyway, that was probably a very too, too much of a long-winded response, but thank you, Barry. Wonderful. So folks, uh, go ahead and type an exclamation mark to share your takeaways. Next up is Kevin. Yes, thank you. And uh, the panelists, uh, my takeaway actually final the same phenomenon um, for the polymath, like a generalist, an integrator of micro potential. And the last one I learned from our group, take a uh, scanner. And uh, um, actually, one question is are this a personal trait for a polymath? Like, and second one is the uh, I find one technique to, to be the polymath, the metaphor. That's the last uh, meetup we talk about metaphor. And uh, I would ask the panelists, what kind of tool set do you recommend to be a better polymath like metaphor? What else? Thank you. And Danielle or Tegan, if you have any, any responses, go ahead. Danielle, go ahead. I think uh, were you asking what tools to be a better polymath for yeah, me? Yeah, what practice to be like a The practice. best tool for me is um, block scheduling. I'm very big on my calendar. I work with a lot of clients. The first thing we do is we look at how are you spending your time? Your time is a reflection of who you are. And if you are asking yourself, who do I want to be? what are my priorities in my life? And yet I go to your calendar and I'm not seeing the answers that you give me. So if you say, I'm, curr I'm currently writing a cookbook. So if I tell you that I want to be an author and you go to my calendar and can't figure out when I'm writing, or more importantly, you, you see me, we catch up in three to five years and you find out I haven't written that book yet. What are we saying? So using your time effectively and having definable block schedules, um, I've heard that four hours is the perfect time for a project block, but I'll leave that up to the individual. But I have set aside times nine to like uh, nine to um, or eight to 12 on Friday mornings. The door is shut. You don't bother me. And I'm working on the project of the month. Usually um, there's about three block times that I have 
um, where I'm working on the project that I've broken down with task. And that is the greatest tool for me in my exploration and um, achieving what I want. Yeah. Oh, Steven, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd i say um, curiosity, but more so I'd say I became a more interesting person the more interested in other things I became. Um, and in order to do that, I had to sort of think and evaluate less. Um, basically, I think in order to find things, you have to find things you're not looking for, you have to evaluate less. So we're taught to really bolster our brains and think and evaluate things. But what it does is it you become more minute in the things you care about or are open to, and you cut off your ability to sort of figure other things out or be exposed to things. So from a curiosity perspective, um, I think it's like silencing the mind. Um, your brain is what tells you you need to focus on something um, because, you know, the ecosystems we were raised in. Um, and it tells you, you, if you're going to work one way and you're, you know, say you're getting detoured, your brain will tell you to find your way back to that specific route. But curiosity will say, well, let's see what this other path has. And that's what leads you to sort of discovering new things um, and then becoming more interested in other things, therefore becoming a more interested person. So um, I think uh, at least my, my perspective of it um, You don't, you're not able to always find things if you, if, if you're thinking of them, or if you can create this concept of your mind, stumbling upon things is very real, right? Things finding you is very real. And I think the only way to do that, you have to sort of silence the mind um, in certain circumstances. There's a quote that stays with me all the time, and I believe in it. Our, our mind doesn't make decisions. Our mind gathers information and synthesizes it, but our hearts make decisions, right? There, there are a million things that we could all be doing that could make us more money logically, but we don't do them because we don't want to, right? That's not a logical decision. That's not, right? It's, it's a decision based on subjectivity and what we care about and what we like. And so I think in, in times like this, you have to be able to silence your brain and be able to sort of awaken your spirit um, and be open to things that you weren't looking for and be open enough for things to find you. And if you have that curiosity all the time, I think that breadth of things starts to open up and then you can start to choose what you can go deeper on instead of just what was presented to you. Can I just add, uh, respond quickly as well? So I think, you know, metaphor and an analogical thinking, as you said, Kevin, um, you, you pointed out metaphor, I think learning, reading, being a critical thinker, having openness and different experiences and getting to know lots of different kinds of people, challenging your own assumptions. Those are all things that I think help you explore your polymathy. And I want to say too, regarding the terms, like there's different words out there like multi-potentialite or scanner or Renaissance soul jack of all trades. For me, the reason I choose polymathy, well, I want to be a polymath when I grow up. So there's that. And the, the reason I picked the polymath word is because it implies you have some depth. You know, you're not a dabbler. A scanner, there's no depth implied. There's just breadth and there's variety implied. You try something and then go to something different. Uh, Renaissance soul doesn't really um, necessarily get at the depth either. It's just sort of you want variety. Uh, jack of all trades has a sort of implication that you're a master of none. So the reason I studied polymaths is because I want to be one. And polymath implies, no, you've, you've achieved, you've really learned, you've become a multi-expert. Um, and so there's depth in addition to the breadth. And that really positions you well to integrate and to, to be creative and innovative and, and break outside the box and see things in new ways and really add value. Great. Uh, next up is Chachi followed by Jade. Chachi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed today's discussion. The, the three of you, I think, um, really gelled well together in constructing the conversation. And I just thought it was neat that um, both Danielle and Keegan identified as being artists. And I think when you think of yourself as an artist, it takes resourcefulness, creativeness, curiosity, you're expressive and you have a sense of yourself because even if no one else understands what you put on the paper, you have a, you understand it. So there's a certain amount of self-understanding that comes um, with being an artist. And I was just curious, 
when you sort of thought of yourself as an artist, and then when you said, no, I'm not an artist, I'm a polymath, like, when did you pick up the other idea of being a polymath versus just saying, I'm just an artist, like everyone else who has a pen in their hand and a piece of paper? I decided I was an artist because we just can decide we're an artist. Uh, the world defines that talent is some crazy thing that was handed down in our genes. But in reality, talent is interest and hard work together. Um, if you want to learn how to draw, you have to put the time in to do it. It takes a practice. It takes a daily effort. So that's first. I'm an artist because I chose to be. Um, and I put the work in. Any of you can decide to be an artist today, but I think it's important that you actually have to be doing something. Now, how you want to define it, whether that's a writer or a musician, obviously artist is multi-defined, but if you're saying you're an artist, you know, if I write my grocery list, I'm not a writer. I, I would need to actually write a little bit every day and at some point decide this makes me a writer today. I'm going to start blogging or whatever. So that, that's first of all. And I don't know that I, I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong, Chachi, but are you saying, when did I decide go from an artist to a polymath? Um, I guess it's the bridging that, you know, obviously I saw the TED talk with Emily and then, you know, I read a couple of books during grad school that kind of opened my mind to the terms, but the bridging of, I am a painter, I'm an art teacher, and now I own an event design company. So I'm organizing a bunch of things, but I'm still using all the arts that I have. Well, now I'm a chef and I'm creating beautiful food on a plate and art and food have a lot to do with each other. It's always bridging this ties to that. And then from a chef, I started studying nutrition science and now I help people with their meal plans and Brussels sprouts are good for you. you know. And that Brussels sprouts are somehow related to the fact that I'm a painter, by the way, I paint food and plants. So it does all tie together. And that's, uh, that's you know, I guess it. Um, and Keegan, I don't, did you wanna say anything? Yeah, I just wanna offer something real quick for, for myself, I think, um, and I think Shukhan actually asked me earlier, for me, it was when I realized that um, I didn't want to replace. So a lot of times in people's evolution, they'll start with one thing and then they find something they love more and they leave this one thing and go fully into this new thing, right? This idea of replacing all of your time. Um, I said jokingly, I don't have enough feet, right? It's because I, I haven't left the things that I started with, right? So I have one foot that's still in technology ever since you know mobile gaming startups, right? Um, even to my job now. And ever since I started painting, I still have a foot there and then I have a foot in media. And for me, I think I realized I was a polymath when I didn't replace new things with old things. It was like I can continue to work, continue to refine um, you know, my craft and, and the experiences there. Um, but the journey wasn't a journey of replacement. It was a journey of addition. And I just want I'm I just want to make one little point too is that I think the way I think of of living life in a polymathic way is that life itself becomes your art. You know Danielle and Keegan they make art on on a canvas and their lives are their art too. And so if you identify as a polymath, think about it that way that this is my life is artistic expression. Uh, Danielle and Keegan, I want to ask a follow up question. How do you choose what to focus on more? Because the, the, what you focus on keeps changing over time. So what criteria, how, how, do, you, how do you go go about choosing what to focus on more? It's the current fire that is burning. And Keegan definitely said it. I haven't let go of anything. Um, right now, I'm really focused on writing this cookbook. And I have that in my calendar. Like I said, I've blocked time to do writing, but I'm still working with, you know, 10 private clients teaching five classes a week yoga. Um, but one of those block schedules is painting. So on the big scale, it may look like I'm doing yoga more, but all my free time and my block schedule time is writing. But 
there's a little bit of space for painting. And of course, I'm on audible.com and there's a book by my bed. So nothing is ever left behind, but there is definitely a fire burning for the one thing. And then that will shift. That could be different next month or six months and different things just take places. Keegan? Yeah, I think um, my whole life I planned for things. I planned and prepared for things and I plan the work and then work the plan, right? Um, and I'm at a point in my life where the idea of planning is very different now. It, life unravels every day, every week, every month for me. And I take stock of what's around me and then I make the best of it, right? So my current circumstances, so I work for uh, Pinterest. It's a, like a mobile, mobile app company. Um, and I like what I do at Pinterest. I enjoy being able to talk business and helping advertisers scale and, and grow with a business. Uh, and that fills my business cup. That also allows me to continue my art journey without requiring it to pay my bills, right? Um, and that also allows me to work on media as well at the same time. Do I have a plan for how these three things will work together or not work together five years from now? No, I, I don't, right? But at this current circumstance, as Danielle said, the fire in me, this is the way it works out, right? This is how I structure my salad right now. In five years, I might want an egg in my salad. I might not, I want to take a crouton away from my salad, right? But I think it, it's being structured enough to make sure that you're committed to the things that you're involved in and you're not just sort of swaying and bouncing back and forth, but it's being open enough to continue to let life, which is art, as Angela mentioned, uh, unravel itself because things change. That's the only constant is change. And I think our life, our decisions and our experiences and interests should mirror that as well. Beautifully put, both of, you, both of you. Next up is Jade, followed by Jeff. Can I just, sorry, can I just observe something real quick? It's like there's this another paradox of like having a plan and an intention and a goal you want to go towards, but going with the flow to some extent too. Like you can go towards it, you can plan it, you can intend it, but every day is going to happen as it does. So there's another paradox we face, don't we? Oh, wonderful. Next up is uh, Jade, followed by Jeff. Jade, Jade, go ahead. Um. I don't remember what you guys were talking about before anymore, um, but I think this still fits in because of what's being said now is the concept of nature versus nurture because um, the concept of the differentiating between jack of all trades, polymath and all the other terms that we have, um, that, that has kind of come up again. And you know, even listening um, to the responses right now, it's there's a lot of skills that are required to be a polymath, which, which, which we are kind of defining right now as somebody with depth, someone who doesn't just kind of dabble in something, but really has a level of mastery. And you can't hit that mastery without one, the right educational tools, whether you're, you're an autodidact or whether you enter a training program, but you also have to have the skills and the, the focus needed to stick with it. Um, I know that's one of the things that helped me coming up is that I was expected to do a lot of things, but I also had people around me who are like, no, you don't just do it. You do it like this. And <clears throat> people who are able to help give me that structure so that I understand when Danielle is talking about, no, you do this in this span of time and you do that in that span of time, who under who who knew how to guide me and help me structure what it was that I that I was doing. So I wasn't just like, hopping all over the place haphazardly without coming out with any kind of um, substance or anything that, so that it, I was doing things in a way where I could present something of value to myself and to others. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, within the conversation, I would like to hear more about nature versus nurture because even in another one that I was at, we were talking about how the end result, people just see that and they don't see how much went into the development of someone who was able to become that. Because the skills of being able to time management, um, talking in different vernaculars, all of those are skills. Code switching, skills. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a question of where, who, who helps you develop those or how did you develop them? Those, those I think it's, it's like, to me, when you're doing these things, it's like there's an episode, Everybody Loves Raymond, where she gives the daughter the recipe for her meatballs, but she leaves one thing out. And so nobody likes her meatballs. And then she finds out half, half, just by accident that the mother left this out. Um, and it's, she, was, she was mad, but she was also like, there was nothing wrong with me. 
there was a good reason why I didn't achieve this. And I feel like we need to give people the oregano. Yeah. <laughs> I loved everything you said. So next week, can she be one of the guests? Okay. That was great. Nature versus nurture. Interestingly, I was very frustrated with my mom in the beginning because she had struggled life. We lived in low income housing. She thought that the fact that I wanted to do so much art, you know, I wanted to be in chorus. I wanted to take art class. I was in drama. She thought that was charming, but I needed to do math, science, foreign language and get A's in English. That's what was more important. And so I was good at school to a point. Um, but on the weekends, she took me to the arts and crafts store and let me, and buy, bought me paint supplies. She found out that I was watching Bob Ross and surprised me with an easel and oil paint so that while she was work, I was a latchkey kid. I could paint along with Bob Ross. That's how I learned to paint. But, but I was not allowed to be an artist. I was not allowed to be a school teacher. I, I wanted to be a singer. I was not allowed to be a singer because those things would not be solid enough. And because she had struggled, I would not. So that nature versus nurture, I wanna make art. I wanna entertain, I wanna paint. She wants me to be a scientist. And because I had been good at school and I liked science, I chose nursing. So that in some ways, she actually helped my polymathy because she might have said, I want you to go into something that's going to be solid like nursing, but she was taking me to the art supply store. She was encouraging my cooking and my Bob Rossing. And so it, you know, it, it kind of, I, I think she really helped it. Um, and her perspective was that I was going to be alone like her. So I had to take care of myself. It didn't quite work out that way. So I, um, I had a lot of opportunities. So, Keegan? I think it's a great question, age old question. I think it's a combination of both. Maybe it's a cop out answer, but I do believe it's a combination of both um, because I think uh, nature creates something and nurture helps that something evolve and become something else, right? Um, and I think both of them are necessary, right? Like a tree without sunlight and soil and water is a seed. Two totally different things but both are required, right? Like the initial seed is necessary and the nurturing of that seed is necessary. So um, I'm a, a fairly big believer in astrology. I think there are things that are specific to us based on like the universe and, um, and things of that nature, but uh, the awareness of those things and, and as much as we nurture them, I think plays a large role in what we become, right? So two examples I think can explain this. Someone who's naturally curious about art, um, but never was trained in it, never necessarily was taught about it, it may show up in different areas. Maybe they were a business person and in every business related role, they were always the creative person with the unique approach. It manifested in a different way, but because it wasn't nurtured in the form of putting paint on canvas, it didn't show up that way to us. And if you reverse it, someone who doesn't care about art at all, but has eight degrees and studied under the most profound artists in the world may know all the techniques, but will never have the passion and fire to create something that ignites, right, the energy and in, in people around the world. So I think both of them play a role, um, a necessary role in becoming who we're supposed to be. Um, I can't tell you which one is more important and which one overpowers the other. Um, and, but I will say, if you look at things from a success level, you'll see people who are successful and only have one. You'll see people who were over nurtured, right? And you'll see people who just broke through different types of nurturing and, and it all came from their nature. Um, so I don't think that's a good barometer to evaluate it, but I do think both are necessary for us to become who we're supposed to be at scale. Yeah, so Jade, I... in the, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I actually asked this question of my interview participants if they, I mean, it wasn't proof, but it was just their testimonials of if they thought their polymathy was more nature or nurture and the, the vast majority, maybe even all of them, I'd have to go back and look, felt it was a combination of both. And maybe they'd feel like one was slightly more in their case, but, but everybody felt it, well, it took both. 
if you had to have the, the nature and then you needed the nurture too. And the nurture, by the way, might not have been, it was handed to me on a silver platter and everything was easy. The nurture might've been, I had some challenges that elicited my polymathy because I needed, I needed to learn. I needed to get a ticket out. I needed to make a better way. And so polymathy, the nurture might have been, uh, might have risen from ease and support or challenge. I want to point that out. Wonderful. Jade, I want to say that you've had amazing takeaways in the last two days on three different meetups, one on the nature of art, one on how language works, language and metaphor works, and now on polymathy. So wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, next up is Jeff. Thank you so much for um, this time and for Angela, uh, you know, all of your work and exploration of, of this. Um, I, I, I want to offer in the true spirit of uh, polymathy, uh, what I consider to be kind of a fundamental challenge to our conversation and our exploration here. Um, and that is, I don't want to take an approach to exploring and defining um, polymathy that is not polymathy, that is not polymathic. In other words, I don't want to take an approach to um, considering it that is looking for one right answer, because I think the entire point of polymathy is in the in the um, the the recognition and the celebration and the exploration um, and the various ways to um, combine multi dimensions, multi answers seemingly potentially even contradictory or certainly balancing out things that are really different. And I don't wanna to have to define polymathy in a singular way without also saying that it itself is multidimensional, filled with contradictions and things that, that are paradoxes or that need to be balanced. So for example, I think everybody's different and I'm the same as everybody else. Um, I believe we're all in this together and I believe we're all in this alone. Um, I think that all of us are artists and I think that all of us are scientists. I think it's all about the journey and I think you need to keep the desired end in mind. Um, I'm an atheist and I'm a believer. Um, the most important thing you know, is to know who I am and the most important thing is to know who I'm becoming. Um, so I, I resonate with an approach to thinking about and considering, defining and exploring polymathy in a polymathic way. And so I find myself resisting these statements about I am, I am this way, we are this way. Well, yeah, and you know, so I find myself saying yes and rather than either or, while also affirming that the differentiations matter. Sorry for taking so long to say that, but it's, wonderfully. Just, it's, been, it's been, you know, it's been kicking my, you know, mental uh, brain around since we started talking about it. Wonderfully yeah. put, Jeff. That was beautiful. Thank you, Jeff. And I just want to say, I think the kind of duality you spoke about that I could, that I'm this and this, even though they, they seemed to contradict each other, that that is uh, something that polymathic types tend to be very comfortable with because it's just how they are how they are and i think that's just how life is and we've got to stop putting ourselves in these narrow boxes and categories where it's black and white thinking or one or the other and embrace the truth that exists in our world and that things can be yes and as you said all right um wonderful so folks this has been amazing. Uh, Daniel and Keegan, it's wonderful to have you here. Just, uh, it was delightful. And Angela, this is great. Uh, do you want to talk about what's coming up two weeks from now? Yeah, in two weeks, we have a session on intra-personal diversity. Um, that is diversity within your own personhood. And, and I would argue that like human diversity can show up in lots of different ways and it can even exist within one person. Um, so that's the topic on February 7th at 2.30 Eastern time. Wonderful. And this Wednesday, we are talking about destruction and creation based on John Boyd. The following 
uh, Comprehensivist or Polymath Wednesday, we are going to be talking about the virtue of ignorance and the power of questions as opposed to answers. Uh, so we've got incredible uh, set of things coming up. So look forward to seeing you back soon. And can I just say thank you, Danielle and Keegan, for joining today. It was so great to see you guys and to chat with you. And you guys made a lot of really great points. And um, just in terms of a final thought, you know, I just want to encourage you all, if you identify as a polymathic person or you want to explore that part of your personhood more, to, you know, to embrace the pieces that don't seem to go together and that that's okay and you're not alone in that. Embrace the paradox. Wonderful. Thank you, Angela. Good evening. Thank everyone. you. Thank you Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.